family. We built a village. Uh, we were able to, to live a good life and understand that family was the most important. And, and that's a little bit about, you know, some of the questions about, you know, being a female versus a male. Um, I overstayed my welcome. I knew we had gone to 12 straight sweet six, uh, 12 straight NCAAs and my first losing season, our vice chancellor who named himself AD at some point called me in for the first time, never wanted to meet with me, never met with me uh, when we were winning. I would ask for a meeting every year and he'd say, what do you want? And then he ended up um, meeting with me and saying, you need to get to back to a final four. And uh, that was after my, he said, it's not like I can fire you, um, but something's got to change. So I hired, I hired an executive coach. Um, you know, I had two little kids at home. My mother-in-law had, had cancer. Um, my partner had her hip replaced. We had to get home care and all that. And we got better. The trajectory went up. We went, uh, I signed the number one recruiting class, um, six players that was the number one recruiting class in the SEC, even above South Carolina back then. And um, a month after when you have an opportunity to get other jobs, I got let go. So for the first time, I, I didn't really know what to do. Called some ADs, talked to some people um, and really, I was one of those people that didn't network. I put my head down. I worked. I love what I did. I'm obsessed with the game. Um, and I was always successful. So didn't really know what to do and um, realized that I wasn't a very good stay at home mom. So 44 days into it, I ended up uh, getting a, an idea that I pitched to Dawn Staley. Um, I had Dawn's very quiet. She's introverted. Um, I met her driving her to the airport once at the SEC, and I tried to share my life with her. I'd only told Pat Summit and Dawn Staley that I had black kids because I knew it would get used against me in the recruiting process. So I told Dawn I had black kids, and <laughs> from that point on, we've been friends. And uh, I decided to, a, a lot of schools called for me to consult Stanford and a couple other programs. And I said, listen, I would just put me on the road more. I got two little kids. So I called Dawn and pitched a job at her and said, you can name it whatever you want, but I wanna help you. You're a defensive guru, I'm an offensive guru. Um, imagine how good we could be. So they made a position for me. I was director of um, offensive coaching analytics. It was really a, a title, um, football title. And I got that job and told her I wanted to learn, serve and grow and uh, told her that I could commute, but it would be better with my family if she had room for all of us. Um, and we all went to South Carolina for nine months. She made a nine month position for me. And then when it ended, um, we won the national championship. <laughs> we checked off every box. She just said, hey, I wanna, I said, what do you want? And she said, I wanna win the SEC again. I wanna win um, the SEC tournament. I want to get to the final four and win a national championship. And I want to become the Olympic coach. And she checked off all four by all five boxes. And I said to her, I said, all I care is that you hold my son up and let him cut, cut the, cut the nets down. And I told her that, Hey, it, she said, Oh, I'll hold him up and do that first. And then I said, Dawn, I said, but there are going to be all these rumors because my, my son's black and you're black and everybody's going to think you got a baby and they got to start talking, <laughs> talking about you. So uh, we had a great time. Things went really well. And then um, I interviewed for some head jobs. Uh, couldn't get them. Thought I could get back on the court and be a head coach and um, tried to get mid-level, low D1 and um, got a lot of interviews, but turn, got turned down consistently. Um, don't know why to this day. I haven't been able to get a head coaching job again. Um, I think I've had six or seven head coaching jobs since I left Vanderbilt. Then um, Marsha Sharp called me and in my, my thing on the women's game, Marsha Sharp, Pat Summit, Jody Conrad, they were my pioneers and idols and examples. And, and uh, I called, she called me and said, will you help do what you did for Dawn um, for another, for our program? My coach is, is struggling and the program is struggling. And so my family and I said, we'll go one more time. <laughs> we moved to Lubbock, Texas. Um, and by Christmas, she forced me out and told me that I was a head coach 
and that I'd be better off with a head coaching job and, and um, was threatened by me because I told her the truth and tried to help the culture. And then nine days later, the AD fired her two games in. They lost by a total 83 points and 85 points. And on New Year's Day, they fired her and the assistant um, that wanted the job and was doing things behind her back um, and not too not not being honest and upfront like I was being got the job and went one and 11. Um, so from there, I, I really had nowhere to go. My family had followed me around. So I ended up, uh, my partner said, this moves mine. We followed you. <laughs> We're going home to Ohio where her family and extended family is because they've supported us. My parents um, disowned me when I told them I was adopting. Um, it's been 10 years now. Uh, since they have spoken to me. So with that being said, we came to Ohio. We live in Columbus, Ohio. Tara Vanderveer uh, had me out to California and said, I want to keep you relevant. I want to keep you in the game. You can be a consultant for me all year. And then I took a driving job. I worked for American Limousine and drove cars, drove uh, rich people around to the airport um, and that type of thing. And uh, we live by extended family that supports us, not on my side. Um, and then I, you know, I just went to camps and clinics and a lot on the men's game. Um, I coached my son's AAU team, all Ohio red second grade, two white women coaching an all black team. Uh, and one black kid, we called him the white shadow and he was terrible, but everybody thought he was our kid. <laughs> so, um, we had experiences uh, that has made me a better person, a better coach, a, a, um, better in every way, um, better understanding. I've seen my, my, my life and my family through my children. Uh, when we were in Lubbock, Texas, my daughter came home and said, I don't care if we move again, my Mel, um, because there's too many, I just, I'm tired of the mean white girls. And she was, <laughs> she was in first grade. I said, me too. And then, and then we moved um, and it's gotten to the point where we've moved um, four times in four years. I got a call from Dawn and she says, Sharon Verse was trying to find you. I had interviewed for the Miami of Ohio job. Um, but again, I felt like a token interview person. Chattanooga, Northern Colorado. I got a whole list of them for you. Um, I think I know every search firm by now. And I got a call, called Sharon and said, hey, I want to come out. Went out there. The day I was out there, Miami said they were going in a different direction. So I was available for Purdue. And she said, I could be senior associate head and get back on the court. So my family stayed in Columbus. Um, this pandemic has been a uh, godsend for me to spend all this time from home and work from home. And we've signed a lot of <laughs> players, probably been more successful than we would have at work and, and spent way less money. Um, but I live in Purdue and have an apart apartment there. And you know, um, it's tough, it's tough being away from my family. My son today came up to me now that now the racial stuff added to everything that I've been doing. Uh, my son came up to me and said, um, so why, why is my color of my skin a threat to cops? Why does that make them so angry and upset? This was today, he's nine now. And um, I didn't know what to say. There's just, you know, I was telling Travis when I met Travis and I said, there's just so many stories that I wasn't ready for. I was, uh, I was at the final four and I couldn't wait to have my son down on the court. I wanted to cut the nets down and everybody else had their kids down. And I started waving for my kids to come down and they're down there. And the, the usher was a white guy. And he said, no, kids aren't allowed on the court. And I'm like, but all the, everybody's kids, they're my kids. And he looked at me, he looked at the kids, he looked at me. And then I realized it was color. And I was like, they're my kids. They're my kids. And I, I kind of went Jersey on them. I started using the F word. And um, then uh, <laughs> Antonio Davis and all parents just started going off on the guy and saying, they're her kids, let them down. I, and stuff like that is really upsetting. I, I, I coach um, and I'm at the Y one day and, and this guy started, you know, I started, he starts saying, well, well, you don't do nothing. And why can't you do individuals with kids. And I said, cause I don't believe in it at this age. I'm not a cone guy and I'm not gonna take people's money. And, and he said, well, you need to be helping these kids. And he got all angry and upset. And I finally said, what's really your problem? 
And he said, I said, it feels like you're angry because I'm bringing up black kids. And he said, yeah, you can't bring up a black son in, in, as a white person. Um, one day I was at, at, at uh, the park with my daughter and that was in Columbus. Before that, I'll give you one more story about my daughter in Nashville. And I was playing with her on a, waiting for her to come down from the ladder. And I said, I got you, Leah. I got you, I'm here. And uh, some uh, white kids that were a little older looked over and said, how do you know her name? And I was like, she's, she's my daughter. And she's like, well, why is your skin color way lighter than hers? And I was like, I, I wasn't ready for all the color questions. And, and I'll be honest with you, um, I waited all my life to have kids because you know I thought they'd be bullied because um, I had two moms and I didn't think it was fair to them. But um, it's been more about color. It's been more about race than I could have ever imagined. And now that what we're going through now um, it's been hard. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I don't, I don't feel adequate. Um, you know, I'm on every diversity inclusion committee. I'm the chair of the WBCA, you know, you name it. I, I I'm trying to say the right things. I'm trying to have the right answers. I'm trying to, but what I'm upset about is that, you know, my kids taught me in Lubbock that it's not black and white anymore. Mom, it's, you, you're, we're brown. I ain't black, we're brown. And you're beige and biracial kids are peach. And what's sad is now that things are going on, it's black and white again to me. And that's how I grew up. I grew up, it was black, black and white. And, and I think biracial families just like, I feel invisible. Like I feel like we've come so far and it's not black and white anymore, but now the, the nation just went back to where it's black and white. My kids don't understand. My kids are confused. You know, our best, fan, our, our best friends, uh, Ryan Perryman played at Dayton and his wife, Laura, he's black, she's white, they're from Detroit. Ryan's mom and grandma died the same week in, with COVID in Detroit. And they couldn't, they couldn't even see, see them. And all their kids are biracial and they've been over the house. They're the only friends my kids have played with. And here's three white women going, we're scared to death for our black sons. We've tried to teach them everything right. We, we don't know, um, but this is a very troubling time for all of us. Um, and there's just, it, it's just sad to me, so much of it. So um, that's pretty much my story. <laughs> it's long. I started writing a book a couple of years ago. And when I got the Purdue job, you know, it's four hours away. So I try to go back and forth, but I don't have control of my time and my life anymore. And, and so I just put my head down and I work and uh, like I'm 25 again and trying to work my way back up because um, my kids are young. You know, I got work another 10 years and I want to do what I do with the people I love. And, um, you know, I stopped hiding 10 years ago, but my life is, is definitely um, different than it was, but better. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. So I welcome any, any questions, Travis? <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm going to let uh, Steve uh, tell his history, his background, touch on some points that he wants to touch on. Okay. And then we'll do, do questions all together. Um, but I'm just grateful when I, I know the people on this call and the people on YouTube and the rising coaches, just for you to just open up and be yourself and tell your story. Cause a lot of the unspoken aspect of the show is just had there's so many things and so many skeletons that we battle black, white, brown, uh, men, women in this profession to make us better that we, we got to overcome ourselves. And I think your story can be so powerful for so many other people. Um, so thank you for that. And if you have questions, put them in the uh, put them in the chat and I'll make sure we get to them once uh, once we finish with Steve and uh, Steve, you're up in the second part of the final four final four panel. So take it away all right thanks travis um so travis mentioned i i'm at loyola now one of the things one of the great things about being the athletic director is a lot of times you can control control meetings control the order of, of when people speak and one thing i learned is that you never want to follow sister jean 
when you when you're speaking. Sister Jean is 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 a, is a legend, and and if I could have controlled this, I don't think I would have followed followed Melanie either. I would have I would have gone first. That was that was great to hear your story, um, and, and it, it ironically that I didn't I didn't know your story. I didn't know about your adopted adopted children, and 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 as I as I give you my background, you'll you'll hear how. Um, adopted kids is a, is a big part of my life, something that Travis probably doesn't know a whole lot about. So um, what I thought I'd do is, is kind of go through my history and try to weave in there some topics or stories that I thought would, would kind of be relevant, but also give you an idea of, of, of how uh, things that help shape who I am today. Um, so I'm going to start way back at the beginning, and, and I promise I, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll get through this in, in less than 20 minutes. Um, well, less than 20 minutes. So I, I was originally, um, I'm from Detroit. I was born in Detroit, um, born to educators. Both my parents were college professors. Um, school was always emphasized in, in my house, in my home. Uh, very athletic family. My dad played college basketball at University of Detroit, um, coached in college briefly um, before becoming a high school coach while he was also working as a college professor and in college administration. My mom also taught um, at community colleges and, and universities. So heavy, heavy education in my family. I uh, mentioned I was born in Detroit, moved to, um, lived in North Dakota uh, for, for a couple of years in St. Louis for a couple of years, but was really raised in rural, um, small town, Western New York, near the campus of St. Bonaventure University. Um, my immediate family, and obviously my parents, I have an older brother um, and two younger sisters. And, and this is where the irony kicks in. Both of my sisters were adopted. They were adopted as babies, um, both from Vietnam. And um, you can't see me, but I'm, I'm six eight. Uh, and my, my dad's about, he was about six five, my mom five nine, my brother six five, and my sisters were, were barely five feet tall and didn't look anything like the rest of us. And so you can imagine um, what, those, what those family pictures looked like. And, and I mentioned before, we were in a, in a small community, rural, and, and they were the only Asians in our community, um, only Asians that went to our school. Um, we knew it, they knew it. We didn't really talk about it much. Um, and we really, we, we made fun of it a lot. I and mean, we, we, we kind of joked about it. And when you look back on it, and when I look back on it, and when I talk to my sister about it now, um, it was just so amazingly insensitive. And, and, and back then it was, it was, I would say as a kid, it was not only tolerated, but encouraged because people always thought it was funny. I mean, the family, the, the way we looked, it was funny. Um, so we joked about it a lot. And um, I, I'll give you an example. So my brother and I, um, he was two years older than me and we, we used to watch professional wrestling like, like a lot of people when we were younger. And back then um, there was a tag team, Mr. Fuji and Mr. Saido. I'm aging myself a little bit, but these were these two, two Japanese professional wrestlers. And, and that's what we would, my brother and I would, we would wrestle with our sisters. We would fake pile drivers and, and throw them around and, and, and we would laugh and, and we would call them. They were Mr. Fuji and Mr. Mr. Saido. Our friends thought it was hilarious. And, um, and it wasn't until, uh, it's been a few years now, but my sister told me how much she, she hated that. And, um, not playing with her brother. She loved playing with her brothers, but looking back on it, she talked about how that really just put a spotlight on how she was different and how they were different. And, and all she wanted to do was be like everybody else that she knew and everybody else that she saw. Um, another, another example, we were in an amusement park once. Um, we were young. My sisters were probably four or five years old. We we're on one of those little kitty rides, one of those spin around, they go up and down. It was, it was airplanes. And my brother and I were both sitting in a ride with our sisters. And as we're going, as we're riding around, there were these two other kids that started like, they were like pointing their guns at us and shooting at us. And the one kid was, was, was making the, the, the slant eyes and they were, they were, they were killing the Japs. And, and I, I was young enough where I didn't really understand what was going on. Um, but as we, it kind of registered with, with me and my brother, we're, we're yelling back and forth at each other, but for us, it was a joke. It was funny. And we started shooting back at him. And I'll, I'll, I'll never forget when we got off the ride and we're walking over towards my mom and I'd never seen her so pissed off. 
Um, she was mad at me and my brother. She was mad at those kids. Um, but as we walked away, the look that she gave the parents of those kids, it, it's one of those moments you just, you never forget. Um, so now my, my younger sister's married um, and she married a, a, a former Grambling football player. Um, he was a lineman. So you, you can imagine six, four black guy, probably all of two, maybe 300 upper 200s, big dude married to my five foot Vietnamese sister. And they've got, they have two kids. They live down in St. Louis. So I was down in St. Louis um, where they live. I said, I, I was at my nephew's high school track meet. He goes to a, um, a private Catholic, predominantly white school. Um, and between races, he came over to us. We're standing, we're up in the stands. He came over to us with a couple of his friends um, and introduces me as his uncle. And um, you know, he's with his high school friends. They're not thinking anything of it. I remember looking around at some of the other parents and if you've been around it long enough, you know, that's kind of what you do. And I'm seeing them do the double, the double takes, like what, what, you know, wait a second, we got the two biggest guys here, one's black, one's white. They're with this five foot Asian woman. This kid runs up, he looks Indian, um, not, not native American Indian, India from the country. Cause he's got that, that black Asian combo. Um, and they're wondering what the hell is going on. And, 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 and those are the kind of looks we get as a family. You get them when we're here in Chicago. Um, but when you're down in St. Louis, that they, they look at you like you're from, a, like you're from another planet. Um, so go, going back to, to, to when I was growing up, we went to a small Catholic high school, um, no blacks in the school, no Asians, except for my sisters, no Latino, we're just uh, almost 100% white. Um, my brother and I started playing basketball. So this is our, this is our life. This is our community. Um, and we started playing for an AAU team up in Buffalo. My brother was older. He got recruited to play up there and I went with him. Um, and this is back in the, this is back in the mid eighties. So it isn't the AAU that it is today. Uh, people didn't, didn't do, they didn't drive an hour to go to AAU practice back then. It wasn't as big of a deal, but that's, that's what we did. And, and the teams that we were on, um, I started with the 15s. He was with the 17s. They were all black kids, all from Buffalo, except for me and my brother and one other kid. Never forget, Kenny Berry was the coach. He played in a jazz band at nights, coached us, loved us. We were the white boys from, from, from down in, 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 the, in, the, in the sticks. That's what he always called us, the white boys. And we loved Kenny, loved, loved being in the program and just happy to be able to be a part of this because we're playing with the best. We're with the best players in Buffalo. And for me and my brother was the first time we ever spent any significant amount of time around black people. And, and, and my, my father played and he had friends from college, but we didn't spend a lot of time around black people until I was 15 years old. Um, and I, 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 gotta, I gotta tell you a quick story. It's, it's a little bit off topic, but, but I, I, I love telling it. It was great when I, I loved telling it when I was a kid. Going into my junior year, Kenny was gonna take us um, take my team out to, to LA and Vegas. So this is back in 19, would have been 84, 85. Um, the tournaments were just kind of starting out there, but to make the trip, we had to raise money. And so Kenny decided we we're gonna have a raffle. Uh, we're gonna sell tickets, dollar a ticket, uh, winner gets a TV. So we sold a, a boatload of tickets, raised all kinds of money. Um, Kenny got sponsors, got people to donate money, and we ended up making the trip. And, and I'll never forget um, now we're heading to LA. We're all excited. That's our first stop. And as we're heading out, somebody asked Kenny who won the TV and Kenny looked at us. He started laughing. He said, man, nobody won no damn TV. There was never going to be a TV. We raised that money to send this team out to LA and to, and to Vegas and nobody wanted television. That was how we raised the money. So it was a good, it was a, a nice little, uh, a life lesson for me where we're going to do anything it took. To, to make this trip. Um, so fast forward a couple of years um, when I was being recruited uh, out of high school. Um, again, real small town, but I, I was able to play um, in this AAU program and went to some of the, the, the higher level camps back then, the five-star BC Invitational. And so there were teams had seen me. I wasn't a great player, but I was big. And, um, and so schools were looking at me. And at the time, the head coach at Penn was a, was a guy named Craig Littlepage. And, and 
Craig is like Coach, I call him Coach Page still to this day, but he was like Mr. Class um, and, and just had an amazing presence, probably about 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, athletic, super confident, always well-dressed, just had a, had a real way about him, the way he carried himself. Um, and that was just when you see him and then he'd open his mouth and start talking and, and he always sounded like the smartest guy in the room I and mean, soft spoken, didn't waste words, um, chooses his words wisely. Um, uh, but he's a pen and, and I didn't mention this, uh, coach page is black. So he's at pen, uh, but I don't want to play in the, in the Ivy league. I thought I could play at a higher level. Um, I grew up, as I mentioned by St. Bonaventure. Uh, Bonaventure's in the Atlantic 10. So I played pickup with those guys all the time. Felt I could play at a higher level. Uh, so I wasn't really into, into Penn. Uh, but then Paige, Coach Page got the Rutgers job. And, and after he got the Rutgers job, it was, it was all over. He came to the house. He did a home visit. Um, after he left my house, my mom said, uh, one of those things you never forget, he walked out the door and he said, that's the man that you need to play for. Um, so I ended up going to Rutgers. Um, and again, remember, I'm coming from a, a, a real small town, super white, um, and now I'm going out to Jersey, going out to Rutgers, and uh, predominantly black team, guys from Jersey City, the Bronx, Patterson, Trenton. Um, I met Jewish people for the first time. I'd, I'd, I'd never met a Jewish person in my life. We're all, where I came from, my town was almost all Catholic or Baptist, um, and had, had a good experience there. We, we were terrible. We, we, we lost a, a boatload of games. Um, the women's team at the time was number one in the country, and we were probably the, the worst team in the country. They get bigger, better crowds than we did. Um, so after my sophomore year, Coach Page got fired. And, and, and I still tell him to this day, he got fired because he recruited players like me. Um, but so after my sophomore year, I ended up transferring to Bowling Green where I played for, for Jim Laranega. Coach Page and, and Coach Laranega, had, they were assistant coaches at Virginia together. Um, so now I'm, I'm, I'm in the Midwest, um, still a, a predominantly black team, more white guys than at Rutgers. Um, but now the guys are from Toledo and, and Romulus, Detroit, Cleveland, a couple of New York City guys, but definitely a different, a different mix than, than when I was out at, out at Rutgers. Um, and, and we say, I mean, we, we still talk all the time, brothers for life. Um, we see each other when we can. And, and you, you guys, you all know you played, you know what that, that kind of experience was, is like. And, and it was just an amazing experience for me. When I finished college, um, I went and played overseas for six years. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about, about France. And, and um, that was the first country I went to. My first job was in um, La Havre, France. And so I wasn't a great college player. We were, I was on good teams and was a role player. I did, I did okay. Um, and so it wasn't like I was going to get drafted or, or team overseas teams were, were chasing me, chasing me down. We had a good point guard on our team who was getting NBA looks. And so some other people would see, would see some of the other guys in the team. So I get, a, I get a call um, from an agent. He didn't speak great English. Um, but he told me about a team that was looking for a, for a player. And the first thing he told me was that they're looking for a white guy and just super matter of fact, um, teams looking for a big white dude. Uh, which is, is something you don't really hear very often in basketball. I want to, I want to recruit a big white guy um, because their last season, they had an American on the team who was black and they had problems with him. And so they wanted a white guy because that was going to solve their problems. And again, super matter of fact, that's just what they were going to do. Um, and I, I learned pretty quickly that that's just kind of how things worked in France. Um, I played over there for, I was in France for, for, for five years, ended up learning the language a little bit, um, which, which helped me understand and listen and hear about the way they acted. So it, in, in France, um, there, there were a lot of players from Senegal. Senegal is a, is a former colony of France. Players from Senegal have French citizenship, French passports, so they can play as locals. So we had a lot of French guys on the team. Uh, were a lot of guys from Senegal on our on the teams that I played for, and and it was just amazing how our, how the how they were treated, how differently they were treated by the white French guys, um, and they didn't even try to hide it. Now that I can speak and understand the language, I hear them talking about um, the where they shopped, how they dressed, the cars the cars they drove, the food they ate. They were just it was ruthless, um, and and so I I got to see that that it lives over in France. Um, 
after five years in France, I had an opportunity to play in Taiwan with one of my former, one of my teammates, a um, guy from Toledo. Uh, he was already there. The money was good. They treated him well. Um, so that's where we went. That's uh, at the time I was married. Our oldest um, daughter was two. And, and we always went together. We went as a family. A lot of guys go overseas and that their, their families stay home. Uh, but we did it as a, as a family. Um, so my wife and daughter go to Taiwan with me. Um, my daughter's two years old. They're both blonde. And in Taiwan, you just, there aren't a lot of white people around, um, but there, there aren't any babies or younger kids around. Um, and they were absolutely fascinated with my daughter. And no matter where we went, they, they always wanted to touch her hair. They'd never seen blonde hair before. So we'd go to the market, we'd be walking the streets and they'd all be coming up to, to my daughter, touching her hair. Um, and, and Taiwan's a real small country. Basketball is pretty popular and games were on TV and, and eventually people would recognize us. And, and then it became even, it was even, it was even more prominent where we, we couldn't, not that we couldn't go anywhere, but people were always, always flocking to my, to my daughter. Um, and we really stood out just because of my size um, and the fact I was white. Um, I was always with my wife and daughter, but a lot of times with my American teammates, but, but all the other Americans over, over there, almost all the other Americans were black also. Um, and, and it was just, it was the, the American, the most popular Americans were, it, we, by no means was I the best player, or even one of the better players, but me and this other guy, um, we were probably the most most popular players with the Taiwanese. Um, we signed the most autographs. We had the most people come up to us after games. Um, and it was because we were white. Um, there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, I, I want to, I was going to tell a quick story, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the time. So Taiwan was my last year plan. I wanted to stay in athletics after, after I finished playing. My daughter was two. Our daughter was two. It was time she was starting to talk and and we wanted to raise our kids in the States. So we came back, um, wanted to stay in athletics, didn't want to coach, um, didn't, wasn't fond of the lifestyle, the summer um, recruiting, the hours, the travel. I'd seen too many of my friends get fired, um, guys moving around. And so I decided I wanted to go on the, the, the AD path. And I went to grad school, um, I went to Ohio University, ironically, um, uh, where Mel Melly talked about Ohio University, I went into their, their sport administration, administration program, um, got, my, got my grad degree, and then I started on my, on my administrative path. I was at University of Georgia for a year as an intern, um, worked for two years at the University of Dayton as the director of marketing. Then I was up, up at Eastern Michigan for about five and a half years, uh, which is where I met, met Travis. Um, and I'll tell you a quick story about Travis. Travis played um, basketball and football. And I'll never forget when he came and started playing basketball because he was that guy that would pick you up 94 feet. The coach would just put him in the game and he'd put him on the point guard and he would be in your grill from the moment you stepped over the, cro the, the line until a timeout, a break and play. I mean, he was just absolutely relentless. Um, loved watching him play basketball. Um, was always afraid he was going to get hurt when I watched him play football because he was he looked he looked like he was seven five out on the football field. I don't know if it was his posture or what, but he just looked taller than everybody out there. Uh, but anyway, I was at Eastern for five and a half years, um, became the number two guy there um, after my first year, and then I got my first day job AD job at St. Bonaventure, which was back home for me. Um, was there for seven years. When I first got there. Um, we made a change in, in basketball. So fired the, the, the men's basketball coach. And, and, and think about this, the coach that we fired was an assistant on the staff when I played at Bowling Green. So when I got there, the program was not doing well. We made a change, but I fired one of my former coaches, um, which was, was, was professionally not the hardest, but definitely one of the hardest things I ever had to do. We went out, we hired Mark Schmidt, who's done an amazing job there. Went to the NCAA tournament in 2012. They went again um, in 2018. Um, but like I said, I was there for seven years before I took the job out at Loyola, Chicago here. Um, and I've been here for about five and a half years. Inherited Porter Moser as our coach. Um, obviously had, had some, some great success. Um, 
the biggest successes for 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 me um, have been we've, we've been able to retain him um, despite the successes he's had, the, despite the different opportunities he's looked at. Um, and and I mentioned before, Sister Jean. Sister Jean is 101 years old and she's still going strong. Um, and it's a great combination and a great team that I'm very fortunate to work at a place like 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 Loyola. I'm going to wrap this up here in a second, um, Travis. So, so I just want to say this because I know Travis talked about trees the other day, the coaching trees, and 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 just to 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 give you an idea, my path was 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 different, and then I didn't have like the big AD trees, you know, the Gene Smith, Kevin White, Joe Castiglione. Those guys are ADs who have um, their disciples all over the place in Division One college athletics, and that's not I didn't come up through any of those um, with any of those guys. Um, my former coach at Rutgers. Coach Littlepage, who I mentioned to you, he became the AD at Virginia and was helpful. Um, but I didn't have a lot of those industry, those big, big hitters in the industry. Um, gotten into the search firms, but but none of the jobs I've gotten have ever been um, jobs that were that were run by search firms. So I kind of went a, a different different path. Probably don't network as much as I should, um, but I do pride myself on. Um, helping people as much as I can, and and I'll, I'll tell this last story, and then I'll, I'll and I'll stop. When I when I was just getting started in the business, I was finishing up my my year at Ohio University, trying to get that first job after grad school, and and this guy I didn't even know that well um, was really trying to help me, making phone calls, writing letters, um, and it didn't make a lot of sense to me why he was he was helping me so much. And finally, I asked him. His name's Chris Caldwell. I'll never forget. And I'm like, you barely know me. You're calling all these people, writing letters. What's what's the deal? Why, what, what, why are you working so hard for me? And he said, when I was in your position trying to land that first job, I had people do this for me. And I always said that if I was ever in a position to help, I would make sure I paid that back. And, and so for me, um, that registered with me. And I know um, I'll always do that. And, and, and I tell people that story when I, when I talk to them about getting into this profession is that at some point in time, you'll be in a position to help people and, and you'll take it to heart and, and do the same thing um, for those people um, because you had somebody do that for you. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe wrap there. I love to answer questions. I've, I've hired head coaches in almost every sport, either as an AD or, or the AD's right-hand man, good ones, bad ones. Um, don't have, don't have all the answers by any means, but um, have learned a ton over the over the years. And the last thing I jotted down that I wanted to mention, I know we're talking a lot about um, about things that are that are that are hot topics in the world today, um, and I and I, I do this tongue in cheek a little bit. But if you if you look up white privilege in the dictionary, um, you, you might see my picture right next to it, and 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 I realized that. Um, and, and I thought maybe that might be a, a little segue. We had a, this is the last thing I'm gonna say, I promise. Um, we had a session today with our athletes. So I had about 30, 35 of our athletes. Um, and we talked about, we're talking about race relations, police brutality. Um, and, and near the end of the conversation, one of, the, one of our white athletes said, you know, we're talking about all this and not one person, we're at the end of this meeting, not one person has brought up white privilege. And, and that's something that we need to make sure we talk about as well. And so I thought, I, I threw that on there at the end. I thought it was something worth, worth mentioning. Um, and and I, I'll stop there now, Travis. I probably spoke for too long. No, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was great. Um, very, very interesting to see the two different views uh, from Melanie's perspective and then from yours. Um, definitely didn't know about the adopted sisters. Um, and I, I want to open it up to dialogue and, and get everyone on the call engaged and ask some questions about things that they would like to know from either a head coach, um, an athletic director, a high major assistant. Uh, and I'll start us with the questions and then feel free to put in because it's, it's so many ways that we could go with this. It's, it's more than what I thought before when we talked the, over the past week. Um, but Steve, I'll start with you first, just because one of the biggest things that's, that's in sports right now is just the ratio between black coaches and white coaches and the ratio between black players and white players. Um, so just looking at the hiring process and as it pertains to black coaches versus white coaches as head coaches and some of the conversations and dialogue you've had, um, some insight that you can give us 
just on how that is taken into account when you when you're talking about hiring a head coach at any level, Division One, Two, Three, NAI. Um, just conversations you may have had, insights you have on that. I forgot about my mute button. Um, you know, you and I talked about this a, a little bit the other night, and 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 it's a, it's a conversation. There's no doubt about it. And when I was at Eastern Michigan. Um, during my time there, we hired a head men's basketball coach and a head men's or a head football coach. And, and back then the black Co coaches association was, was real strong. And they, they had this, they had this report, they called it the, the report card and every head football coach hire was, was put through, um, was under scrutiny by the black coaches association. They gave you a grade, they gave you a grade at the end. Um, and so, I'm not the athletic director. I'm, I'm the kind of the, the right hand man and, and I'm facilitating the process, talking to coaches. Um, but this whole time at a state school like Eastern Michigan, there are some some expectations when you go through a, a hiring process, um, diverse pool um, and, and truly uh, interviewing minority candidates um, and then the Black Coaches Association was also played a part in this. And so, and I've got the athletic director who's on me and saying, well, we're gonna get an A um, and, and you're gonna do everything you need to do to satisfy the, the, university's, um, the university's regulations. But at the same time, his, 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 his focus was finding the best football coach possible. And, and I think under that process, it forced us to really look at a, a wider breadth, a, a bigger pool of candidates. And we spoke to people that I'm absolutely convinced we would not have spoken to. And then if you fast forward a couple of years when we hired our, our, our men's basketball coach, and it's, it, Travis knows, um, knows very well, when we, when we hired Ramsey, we weren't under the scrutiny of, of the, the Black Coaches Association. We weren't gonna get a grade but that really impacted the way we, we ran that search. And, and as a result, we had a much broader pool, um, a much more diverse pool. And we spoke to people that I'm, again, absolutely convinced we wouldn't have spoken to if we didn't have that kind of guidance from the BCA. Um, and that's something that's, that, that's gone away. It's not there now. Um, th there isn't, I don't feel like as much of a, pressure is not the right word, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say there 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 isn't that that I use the word even though it's probably not dead on but there isn't that kind of pressure um, to do things that way now. Hey, uh, hey, Colt. I actually um, I just want to follow up and and get your your insight. I was listening to um, the coaches panel the other day that ABC. And uh, Coach Calipari had a really, I thought, a pretty good suggestion uh, about having more minorities in those entry level positions, your graduate assistants, internships. Um, I know it's maybe something you've just heard of, uh, but, but kind of what, what would your thoughts be to something like that with, with your athletic department? So, so let me, let me I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to first say something else before I answer that question is, the, the other piece and the reality of this is the athletic directors look like me um, and, and, and you're going to tend to hire somebody you're, you're familiar, comfortable mm -hmm. with, somebody who you feel like is, is like you, whether you think it or not, that's, the, that's what you're going to do. And so it, it, it isn't necessarily, it's not, a, it's not a, an issue of having good candidates. There, there are, you guys know better than I do. There are a lot of really good candidates, white, black, um, it's a matter of, of, of getting that opportunity. And so that's a problem as well. And, and it's, it's, it's at the athletic director where it's getting better, but it's not even close to where it needs to be. Um, one, one of the things that, that we started doing at Eastern Michigan, all right, Eastern Michigan, here you go. That's the Travis influence. But one of the things we're doing at Loyola now um, is we started that same thing for athletic, for that athletic director track where we're going to have, um, a woman or minority um, in a position on an, hopefully it'll just be for one year uh, to get them in the door um, and on a path. And, and it's going to be a catch-all 
position where they can learn about everything in the athletic department. It's not going to be um, just uh, academic services. So where, where do our former black athletes tend to, to start in, in college athletic administration? Their, their academic services. And, and, and that's, I, we're not gonna, we're not gonna put them in that box. And so we just hired this young man, Brady Watson, um, no relation. Uh, Brady's a former, he ran track, played basketball. Um, he told me today he's six, seven. I think he's probably six, five. Um, but Brady's a, a young black man who we're gonna mentor and, and put him in a position to be successful in this industry. And, and, and I think that's, that's, our, that's our responsibility. And so you take that to the, to the basketball, the, the coaching side of things. And again, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a no brainer and, it, and it's a great way to, to, to cultivate and to train and, and to get people ready, um, uh, young black people ready for those kinds of positions. Um, but, it, but it's bigger than that. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's me and my job as well. But I would support that 100% without a doubt. Um, just to ricochet off of that and go, go with you, Melanie, ask a question in regards to, uh, the topic that we on as a head coach, um, as a woman, that's, a, that's, a, that's in a, a special relationship and has, and has a partner and has two, two black children. Um, how do you feel likeness and image plays a role in, how that happens because as a black male, you know, we find ourselves in the same position. We got we, we often say we got to work two times harder. Um, and in life, the white privilege gets a 10 yard head start. When we, we start 10 yards behind and you say go, and we got to fight the same fight to get to the, to the finish line. And some things that we have to do in order to make up that ground ends up becoming strategic. So um, how do you think that will play into changing, changing the numbers and, and integrating cultures? Can you guys hear me? Travis, you kind of froze up there for a minute on me. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, it's very interesting on this side because when I got the jobs I got, um, I'll be honest with you, I haven't gotten a head coaching job since, since uh, I've had a family and I've been out and my family looks the way it is. We can't hide it. Um, you know, we're not going to pass that shame down to our kids. Um, and, you know, I'm 57 years old and I'll be honest with you. I've also interviewed for two head coaching jobs in the WNBA. Um, didn't get either one of those. And I um, had a call um, about a men's D1 head job. Um, I almost at this point feel like I may have a better shot coaching on the men's side or in the pros than the college route. And I think a lot of that, you know, I've been asked, is it your age? Um, I'm 57 now. Uh, they, in my interviews, I'll be honest with you, it's usually uh, the white woman that's old and overweight and looks at me and says, how do you stay relevant? And, and it's hard not to get pissed off because I want to just say, how do you stay relevant? I mean, I, I got to, you know, I tell them about my family. I'm transparent. I'm up and I'm front. I have other colleagues telling me, don't tell them about your family. Don't have your family come to the final four with you. Don't have your family, you know, cause you can't hide anything. Um, and then when you get the job, do what you want because it, you know, ADs, you know, they want to get the press, they want to win the press conference and, you know, they don't really know what to do with it. And so like this past year, all the jobs had opened, which there weren't many. Um, I had a friend of mine, <laughs> write down for a diversity and inclusion, almost like a report card like they used to have and who got hired. And the, there was great progress on the African-American female side. They got the most jobs. Um, after that, it was uh, white females and then uh, white and black males. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I looked at the list and I said right back to them, I said, so how many gay women are <laughs> Are on that list that are over 40. And, you know, I've had people say, is it, is it your age? Is it age discrimination? And when I, when I interviewed for a men's D1 head job, um, I'm, I would be young for the job, to be honest with you. 
You guys, you, you have to take a lot longer on your side to work your way up. Right now, the cool thing on the women's side, the pro hire young assistant where we, you know, they can save a lot of money. Um, and to be honest with you, like my resume is, you know, in the corporate America, it's that 55 year old guy that you got to get rid of and hire a young person for. Um, that's, you know, wearing a, a skirt and pumps and doesn't have little black kids coming out of the stands. So um, I, I, you know, it's hard. I don't know where that is coming from. I don't, I'm starting to really try to get out of my box and try to network. And, and like, I was, I was so excited to be called by rising coaches and, and I'm really excited to have some women on here because I think there's a time when um, at some point, if I'm the most qualified, whether I, what gender, you know, I might be the best coach and it might be on the men's side. Um, you know, I've always dreamed about coaching on the men's game, but no one's ever hired me as an assistant in the NBA. You know, you got 13 or 14 assistants. So they're hiring a young female that played in the WNBA again, a quarter of my age and experience. So there's just so many factors in, in my situation. I'm not really sure. Um, I have a great, a, a, an agent I actually hired last year which I never needed before, but um, he's from Rutgers, Steve. Uh, um, and he has a lot of African-American um, clients and they're almost all on the men's side and he's trying to get over on the women's side. So I'm kind of trying to bridge those things together. Uh, Jason Belzer, I don't know if you know him, Steve. I think we, we have a lot of common people <laughs> in our life and we know a lot of the similar, uh, it's, it is a small world, men's and women's. And, um, you know, I know Mark Schmidt, he was on Skip Prosser's staff uh, when I was there. And, and, you know, my champions were Skip Prosser and Pat Summit. And Pat, I'd have a job today if Pat were alive I, or Skip was alive. But, but I'm the same way. I don't come from a coaching tree. Um, you know, my dad, he taught me basketball and, and how to coach. And, you know, Pete Carrillo has come to games, but um, when I coach back at Princeton, but that's it. You know, I, I just don't have that to get me where I need to go. So I'm, I'm really just trying to be, um, we could, what, what, again, Steve was talking about, I mentor a lot of people. I get calls all the time, mostly African American females and males. And I share my experiences and then I try to help them. And I think what comes around goes around. It's my philosophy as a coach. You set a great screen, you get somebody else open and it comes back tenfold. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, you know, I, I think th there's a lot of differences in our game, but at the same time, you know, I'm thinking at some point, maybe maybe I'll be able to coach my sons. Uh, my dream was always to coach his high school team some at some point, but maybe something else will happen differently. I, I, I don't know where that at, is at, but I do think things are um, starting to blend into the, hey, let's just get the best coach here. And it's much more uh, about that on the women's, on the men's side than it is the women's side. Uh, the women have a profile. Um, they're, they're, you know, a lot of people are checking off some boxes and, and really putting some people in sit situations, black and white, young, they're going with young, young and younger and, and they don't have to pay them much. So, and I know, um, this pandemic's not going to help it at all. <laughs> so, um, and I never got this, I never got in this for the money. Um, Skip Prosser always used to say to me, called me Balkan Ball. I can still hear him today. He said, Balkan Ball, don't chase the money, let the money chase you. And that's kind of what happened and uh, became a victim of my own success. And then the game, the women's game has gone down. And uh, it's, it, it's, you know, it is where it is, but there's so many different variables. Um, and I think what Steve hit on is, you know, we just got to help each other as much as possible. And, and I want to connect with as many men coaches as I do women's. Cause that's, you know, I grew up studying the men's game and that's what I study today. And I've gotten, you know, in interviews, I've gotten to meet some incredible, you know, I, they flew me up in Michigan state and I was like, Oh my God, I get to meet Izzo and talk to him <laughs> in his workroom, you know? And that was amazing to me because he is somebody that I, I have stolen a lot of stuff from. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping things will, will uh, I'm hoping people can just bridge 
like I, I'm trying to bridge that gap. It's like I'm doing it as an assistant and I'm trying to bridge, you know, any way I can bridge men and women together. Um, I think we should just get the best option. If there's a question, somebody want to ask a question, you can. If not, I'm, I'm going to go back over to Steve. Steve, and uh, bridging that gap. So what you guys are doing at Loyola is awesome as far as just bringing in members in the black community, minorities, men, or minority men, women, to, to kind of place them and put them in leadership roles. What can you do or what can we do or what can the community do in order to get that to kind of ignite and take a flame across the country and get other athletic directors and other institutions on board with having that same type of philosophy and feel? Or do you, is that something you think is so far out of reach that is not, that is not attainable in the near future? No, I, I think, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to try to kind of control what we can control um, as far as how we're approaching this. And so like we, we met, I met with the athletes today. I met with our coaches and staff yesterday. And, you know, the, the message I got from our, from our coaches and our staff was, was loud and clear. And they said that this, this should be driven by our athletes and, and let's listen to them before we start shoving things down their throats and telling them, you know, we're going to set up our, we're going to have this subcommittee and we need five people here. And, and let's listen to our, let's listen to the athletes. And so the things that I heard today, um, I mean, they're so basic and simple and, and, and things that we just don't think about, you know, we have a, we have a black student alliance on campus, but we don't have anything within our athletic department. Um, and so we're going to, we're going to put that, that's going to be where we start. And, um, and, and our black athletes were crystal clear in saying, um, you don't have to be black to be a part of the Alliance. Um, and, and so I thought that was, that was pretty cool, but then things can filter out from there and they can, they can, um, they can drive initiatives and programming. Um, but that was one of their focuses was, was getting that, that structure there. But then the, the big piece for them was, was education. And, and how are we educating? And it's not, it's not reading a book. You know, we can, we can give them all a book or say, watch this movie or read this article. Um, they felt very strongly that the best way to educate is to, is to tell stories and, and, and talk about different situations that, that people have been in and have, have some, some active dialogue rather than, um, again, shoving something down, shoving something down their throats. And, and, and we talked about um, this isn't, we're not gonna sit around and talk about it and post something on social media and say all the right things. Um, we're gonna be sure that we're actually acting and doing something and, and, and doing things differently within our athletic department. Um, making sure that uh, big focus for us is mental health. So, so we, we have a, a, a person who's dedicated to mental health for our athletes. She works exclusively with our athletes. Um, and we thought we hit a home run. She, she does a fantastic job. She's, she's young. She played softball, division one softball in college. Um, but she's a 24, 25 year old white former athlete. And, and some of our athletes are like, you know, I, I don't, I, they may not, they may not want to open up to a, to a white woman. They may rather have a man or, or a, a person of color. And so we need to, to go beyond checking the box and, and, and doing the simple thing and make sure that we're, we're addressing all of our athletes in a, in a much more global global way. Um, and, and so that, that's, our, that's our, our focus is, is, is really doing what we can at Loyola. We'll tell the story and we'll, we'll, we'll communicate that. Um, and, and that's really our, our focus, I think, much more so than um, you know, trying to, to, to create some kind of a national storm or um, We've got there, there's so many needs in our department, in our neighborhood, where we where we're located in Chicago. Um, there, there's a lot of really good things that we can do, and a lot of good things we're gonna do. Um, and that that's gonna be that's gonna be where we start anyway. We're gonna start in our own house. The uh, this is going back over to Melanie. Any questions for Steve as we go? We've got about 15 minutes. Um, and just to reach out and, and, and things that might be on your mind, things that can be answered from his perspective or Melanie's perspective. Uh, if we don't, I, I got a question, Trav. 
Hey, Steve, uh, this is Robert Ford. I'm the head men's basketball coach at Salem University D2 School, also a former EMU Eagle. Uh, played with Travis. If you thought he picked up 94 feet in the game, you should have saw him in practice. Uh, but that's besides the point. Um, got a question about when you're going through a head coaching search, um, do you prefer if, you know, a candidate is a little bit more aggressive and, you know, follows up on emails by sending you his coaching portfolio and things of that nature, maybe has his contacts um, or references uh, follow up with you as well, or is, is that overkill and you just, you know, want to get the resume and then narrow it down from there? And then my second question to that is once you start narrowing that list down, what holds more weight for you? Um, is it, you know, a coach having consistent success or being part of a consistent program if it happens to be an assistant or if they have, you know, a really big name or somebody championing them uh, that can kind of, you know, help in the uh, press conference and things of that nature and kind of bring uh, some good notoriety to the, to the university? What, what kind of holds more weight uh, for you in, in your eyes? So when I um, when I got to St. Bonaventure and we started we we, we started our search, um, one of the first pers person people that I called was Coach Littlepage, Craig Littlepage, who was my coach at Rutgers at the time. He's the AD at Virginia, and and I've been through searches as the kind of the second guy, but I hadn't run one myself. Um, and he gave me a piece of advice I'll never forget. He said, "You're going to get calls from." the Dick Vitale, Mike Krzyzewski, all these guys, he said, you, you don't listen to anything those guys say. They all have an agenda and it has nothing to do with you or St. Bonaventure. The people you want to listen to are people that either care deeply about you having success or care deeply about St. Bonaventure having success. And if you can find people who care about both of those things, those are the guys or the men or women that you really need to listen to. And so um, I remember when I was at Eastern Michigan and because uh, uh, we, we interviewed some some candidates and one of them was from Michigan State and Izzo called and, and our AD got all excited. Um, he came running down the hall, Krzyzewski called and he was pushing a candidate. And I just, and it, it didn't register with me then, but when I talked to my, my, my former coach, it, it just, it, it really clicked with me. And so as we're going through the process, those are the things that I really try hard to do. And that's why I wish I had maybe a, a broader network of people that I really know and trust so that when I get a call and somebody says, Robert Ford is, is somebody that you want to have on your staff. If it's Travis, then it carries a hell of a lot more weight than if it's Tom Izzo. And in my book, because I know Travis and Tom Izzo might be doing a favor for one of his friends. And, and that's the, the side of the business that, that I don't think everybody realizes. And so for me, I, I don't get caught up in, in, in the, the, the high profile people. I want people that I know and trust, and I'm going to find people that I know and trust who can help me, um, help me with the, with the process. Um, I think that answers your second question and I'm, I'm not very smart. So I already forgot your first question. Did I answer that one too? Or it was just, as you're going through the process, is it, good for you know a candidate to continue to reach out and you know maybe follow up with their portfolio or would you prefer if they just hit you with your resume and then let the process play out so so and and that that's going to be it's going to be different for different people i love persistence um but i also like i like i i tell people you want to differentiate yourself and so everybody's going to make phone calls everybody's going to send emails but what can you what can you do that makes you stand out and makes you different from some of the other candidates? And to me, the handwritten note, it's like so old school, but, but I just, it's different. Nobody does it anymore. And, and who doesn't like getting something in the mail, um, something personal in the mail. And, and so what I've always said to people is if, if, if there's a job you want, or if there's somebody you really want to work for, um, you give them touch, there, there's gotta be a lot of touch points and, and there might be some jobs for me that I'd be interested in after Loyola. And so I probably want to make sure that the search firms know me. They know that the, the jobs I'd potentially be interested in, but the commissioner of that league, the president of that university, they also know who I am. And it's these little notes and, and, and touch points where it's different from what everybody else is doing. Um, but if you can find somebody who knows whoever's making the hire, um, Melanie said before, 
when she's going through the process with the um, with the head coaching hires on the women's basketball side, a lot of times it's the SWA. Um, and, and so on the men's side, 99 times out of 100, it's going to be the athletic director, the president, the search firm. But if you can find out who is actually going to make that final decision or who's in the ear of the person who's making the final decision, you got to find somebody that that person knows and trusts, and that's your best way in. Um, Cause that's what I'm listening to. Um, if Travis tells me, I, I, he, you got my ear there. Um, but if it's, it doesn't matter, you know, Tom Mezzo, he doesn't know me. He, he's, he doesn't care. He doesn't care about Loyola or, or if Steve Watson's successful. It doesn't matter to him, um, but it matters to Travis. And, and that's important to me. So, so persistence is huge, but doing something different, not, not what everybody else does. It's so easy to send an email. You get a guy's cell number. It's so easy to send a text, but that's what everybody else is doing. And you want to be different from everybody else. I stole I stole our program's motto that we're built different from Steve because for many, many years, he said, you got to find a way to differentiate yourself. You got to find a way to make yourself unique. Um, so that's genuine advice coming from coming from Steve. Uh, Melanie, just to finish up with you, it's 923. I want to be done by 930, uh, 830 Central Time. Uh, Men and women on the women's side, do you think it's easier for, and this is just a question that's coming from uh, data I've collected before we got to the unspoken situations. Do you think it's easier for men to advance on the women's side than it is for women? And, and what's your thoughts behind the man and the woman working on the women's side? Um, I think there's just for a lot of reasons um, from a, a society uh, perspective, um, a man is usually the, the money maker in the family. And so it goes way back. I think, um, it is a lot of times easier. And I think that's why, you know, a lot of the men and it's so competitive on your side as well. And a lot of the men have come over to the women's side and have moved quickly, um, and moved up the chain because, you know, they, in society, they're, they're used to making that money family moving with them. And like I said, from my personal vision, um, I overstayed my, my welcome at Vanderbilt because uh, we had created a village. My partner had a good job in, um, in mental health. And, you know, we were, it, it made sense for me personally. Before that, I would have already taken another job and moved on like a man would and the family followed me. And in the end, that, that had to happen. But I would have been, done a better job at, of staying ahead of the curve. And I think, you know, in the interview process, even, even with recruiting, I'll have parents ask, you know, do you have kids? How many people, you know, um, they're not supposed to ask if we're, we're, we're married. They never ask the man if he's married and who he's sleeping with, or does he have kids and would that interfere? And so that's why a lot of people have told me, uh, you know, about my family, you know, you just, you, you just want to get a job. Like you got to be more like a guy, but at the same time, you know, I think, it's easier for guys to be um, outspoken and aggressive and they, they like that because they're comfortable with men. So I think it goes back to a lot of um, stereotyping, kind of like we have um, with the, the racial injustice that gets passed down over generations of what we should be like and how we should be. Um, I know, you know, if, if I go um, say some stuff and I've done, you know, I've been at Frank Martin's practices, <laughs> believe me, my son cried and wanted to go home. And uh, I love Frank Martin. He's, he's one of the best guys I've ever met in my life and, and in a biracial family situation. And a woman, if I said so any of those things, I would have lost my job a lot earlier for a lot of different reasons. Um, so I, I feel like there's so much difference and, but it, it all comes back to like what, what Steve's saying these athletic directors are making the hires now, even, even on the women's side, it used to be the SWA. So I know all these SWAs and they want to help and they call, but they don't really know the AD. And now the AD is making that hire because there's more money involved. And, and, you know, I, I didn't never got into it for the money. Um, I made nothing for a long time and, and I was happy, <laughs> extremely happy. But when I reached a point of success, that money came after me. And, and um, 
So I think I do. I, I think the men I've hired two men um, later. I had women all along and I know Muffet talks about that, but I hired um, two men and they were both African-American men. Um, and that's how I got to know Travis is, uh, and, and one of them is now a head coach at UMass Lowell. Um, I, I have a female that's a head coach at Toledo and a female that's at Tennessee Tech. And um, I, I have a, built a tree under me that is very successful and, and I'm very proud of in my year off, I went and consulted for all them and helped them. Um, but I do think that, you know, I, I think I hired two men and I got to know Dale Faro and I think he's going to, he's going to get on this call because I, I liked having a man on my staff because all the AAU coaches, they're African-American men and to get players. And nowadays it's about getting players and they feel close with their guy that looks like them. And I think that happens a lot. And so when I did that and it worked, I tried to get some, and he went on and became a head coach. And then I looked for another one. And, and I'll be honest with you, with me, it's all about connection. And, and I think that's what Steve's saying. It, it doesn't matter if you're a female, male, you got to connect with people. Um, to get the job done, to keep kids in the program, everybody's transferring. You got to keep recruiting them while they're in there. And you have to be able to connect. And so I, I think the more you open your box up and don't stereotype, and uh, I, I sat in my office for hours just making calls to the people that, that I trusted in my last hire because I knew it was a really, a really big hire. And Dale Faro, he had the a one page resume. He had the smallest resume. But when we connected, he told me his story. I told him my story. I felt so comfortable with him. My staff wanted me to hire all these other people that were like positioning themselves to be this and that want to know how many years I had on my contract because they heard, you know, I'm going the wrong way. And, and uh, I ended up hiring Dale because he was hungry. Um, he was a hard worker, but he was a connector. And I felt that connection with him right away. And he didn't, he just studied the game and loved it. And um, now he's at Cal. He's been extremely successful as an assistant coach at Cal. Um, and I still talk to him, was texting with him yesterday. You know, I think again, it's more about the connection and the feel that you have for people um, in anything that we do. What, and and I, think, I think we profile too much, just like we do <laughs> Everywhere else, we shouldn't be profiling when we're picking these coaches. It should it should be the connection. And that's what I want. I want to hire somebody to connect, connect with everybody because my program is going to be diverse and I want it to be diverse. You know, I want to have all different, um, you know, I coach a lot of kids from Africa and you name it, different countries internationally, black, white, and I want to have the best players and and, and win and have like um, an incredible culture that is diverse like my family. So I want coaches that, you know, one of my best coaches I ever had was from California and she was African-American um, and uh, she didn't, she didn't know crap about basketball. Now she played, but she didn't, she just was so good with people. And I think we overlook those people skills and just connect with people. Cause you don't have to be the white coach talking to the white kid and the black. And, and personally, I get really offended about that a lot of times because I connect really well with all kinds of people. And yet I get locked into, you know, you, we're going to have the black assistant try to get that kid. And I'm like, you know, um, and it has nothing to do with just having black kids. It's just that I've connected with so many different types of people on a different level on a deeper level, then um, I don't, I don't, I just don't, I don't want to be boxed in either. So I know how you guys must feel when you get boxed in. It's not a good feeling. I have a question. Go ahead, Aisha. Um, Coach, when you, when you consult um, with these head coaches, what's, what's one thing that you see them struggle with? And, you know, what's, what's the main thing that you are helping um, head coaches with when you do your consulting? With head coaches, um, I think it's about hiring the right staff. Um, I think that's really um, something that's not really taught. I've actually been asked by a couple programs maybe to come in and consult and meet with their staff when they're doing like their evaluations. And then 
I've had some cons coaches confide in me. Um, I think it's hard because they don't, they don't really have anybody to go to to talk about their staff. And whatever you put in your little team under you is just going to ooze down. So if you don't put the right people under you and you put in these boxes, like I need a black female, I need a white female, and they're not connectors and they don't value the same, they don't have the same values, core values you have and can't sell your vision. And it's, it's, um, it'll trickle down into a bad culture. And so I think that's the biggest thing is I don't think coaches really realize how important hiring that staff is. They're in a hurry. They're in a hurry. So they hire real quick. And then a year later, you see them fire the whole staff start over again. Um, I, I, I heard a, a quote one time, hire fast, I mean, hire, uh, fire fast and hire slow. And uh, I, learned, I learned my lesson with that. And that's something that I've always kept in my back pocket that uh, I think is very true. Well, good. Um, hopefully it was some, some positive information taken from the call. Uh, just real quick, Steve, and then I'll go to you, Melanie, just one or two nuggets from the, for the group to have just to make them better players, better people, better players, better people, better coaches, um, things that can, that can help us become more successful in your view, just in, in, a, in a quick 75 second wrap up and then we'll get ready to close out. So Steve, you up. And run the clock. Um, I'll, I'll say this: I, I I threw my my cell number and my and my email in there, and, and I'm not just doing that because because I, I feel like that's something I should do. I'm doing it because I, I'm I'm hoping that if 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 I can ever help, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and 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 that's a part. I guess that'll be my kind of parting shot as well. Is 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 you got to grow your network. And, and and Robert had a great question. And and in order to 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 get yourself um, to, to start the kind of relationships with people that are gonna gonna be able to help you down the road, you got to extend yourself, get get a little bit uncomfortable at times. Um, but there are so many opportunities to do that um, when you're traveling, uh, when you're recruiting, looking up people. If you want to meet people in search firms, be be persistent. If you want to meet athletic directors, um, they might not all respond right away, but I guarantee you, um, a lot of them will because they're, they're going to want to help you out as, as well. So I'd say broaden that network. Melanie, 75 seconds or less, two nuggets. Got to unmute. Got to unmute. Lost time on that mute. I'm going to ask you guys a question. If I, I got a Division I head coaching job on the men's side, how many of you would want to work for me and be willing to work for me or what? What would be your concerns? Would there be concerns of, because obviously I would hire an all male staff, um, depending on the school, probably need a, a strong African-American uh, male. What would that look like? And, and be honest and transparent, would that be something, would I have a tough time hiring you? Any guys willing to tackle that? Me, I, I, I'll tackle it. I'm, I wouldn't be opposed to it. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of like the a little bit of you guys, uh, just kind of reflecting on myself. Uh, very straightforward. I, I kind of have my head down, and I want to do the best job possible. But I did started thinking about a question, and it's kind of always bothered me. And I talked to Travis the other day. Um, what are your guys? And, and I'm sorry, Travis. Just real one quick more question. What are your guys just take on social media and trying to brand yourself that way? So, so I'll, I'll hit it from an athletic director standpoint where I'm not, I'm not active. I don't, I look at Twitter. I, I, I don't think I've got more than I tweeted out. Like when I first started the account, maybe two or three times, I'm just not, it's not me. Um, I think it might be an age thing. You know, I'm 50, 53, 50, 53, I'm 53 years old. Um, and I just don't, I'm just not, I, I just don't, I don't live there. Um, but I know recruits do. And so it's, it's important to have, have a, a social media presence for me. I'm not hiring anybody cause they got more followers than somebody else. Um, but, but I think it's probably more important on the recruiting side. So for me, it's not, I don't want to say it's a non-factor, but it surely isn't. A, it's not a big factor.
just Melanie, your 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 take on um, social media. Hey, Coach. Um, I actually I have a lot of experience now going to different staffs, and I'm seeing the staffs from the other side, which I wouldn't have had that opportunity to do after being a head coach at three programs for 26 years. And I'll be honest with you. Um, I've joined some staffs that people branded themselves really well. And when I got there, that's what, that was not who they were. And um, I, I know everybody says to do that and position themselves with titles. And, and I'm old school. Actually, it's a red flag for me because of the experiences I've had these last four years being on other people's staff and saying, this isn't the person that they branded themselves. And then they continued to brand themselves while I was there instead of being the hard worker. If you got that much time to brand yourself, um, you're not doing the job you could be for the coach. I do understand if I hire you, you know, that coach, I, I need you to um, know social media, do your job with social media for recruiting purposes. But there, I think there's too much uh, time spent on people with their own brand. And then they're not, it's kind of like a dating service, you know, and then you go to get, you go on the date. And, and it's not the person that you saw all this time. It was somebody else. Yeah, just, just one more thing, Travis. And I'd say we, we have people on our staff in our, in our communications department who, who control and who manage our social media. Um, now obviously, our coaches, they, they, they use it in recruiting. But um, I want coaches who can coach. I want coaches who can relate to our players face-to-face. -to, -face. Um, to me... That that that's that's more important. Our our the branding that we that we that we do or we have with our with our our different programs, um, yeah, our coaches are involved in that, but that's managed by our uh, by our communications department. I can answer that question because um, I work I work with social media. Um, I I work with University of Kentucky women's basketball, and when I got to my staff, our coaches like kind of hated it except for one assistant because she's she was like 28 she was kind of active but um kind of to go to go with your point um coach you you didn't really appreciate it as much because um people were faking um so that that's a that's a valid point so to you coach it's good when you are being authentic and it is good in the recruiting aspect because we kind of, we was able to turn our, our image around just like that. Like in 2016, Kentucky um, had, you know, some, some tough years and we, we were able to just create our own narrative um, because they was able to hear um, our head coach's voice. It was able to see, you know, their, their values and stuff like that. So it all depends on the person. Um, because if you got a person that's being fake online and they're they're not the same in the office, that's not the branding. It's it's the person. That person is being fake. So it's like it just, it just all depends. Like it, it's a, it's a balance. But I think it's good. I think it's peer to peer is really good. Um, I don't think I don't think like if I was talking to an assistant, I wouldn't I wouldn't say yeah you should bring yourself to get a head coaching job. I don't I don't think that is what it is helpful for, but it is helpful for people to understand you if you're using it in an authentic way. So it just, it just all depends um, if you know how to use it. Um, and you no, I appreciate, yeah, I, I'm more thinking just of, of your, like Melanie, you're kind, obviously you're known and just having more, I guess, voices and, and people will see you because every, there's so many people that are on there yeah. and there, you, you, you can, find someone clear across the country because of their social media not necessarily because they're going to get a job, but obviously more information purposes. Right. So, um, so he, he might not be on social media as an AD cause he don't have time, but, um, Travis might be on social media and Travis might, might've got to know you through social media and you might be on this call because you've seen it on social media and now you can bridge to get the connection that way. So it's just, it's just, you know, it's just word of mouth type thing. So I think it works the same way as, as networking works in person. Um, it's just an opportunity for you to kind of um, change that narrative or, or write your own narrative. Definitely a tool. Um, yeah, just great to point. Yeah. Can, I, can I speak on that social media part? Uh, so I was a manager at Temple and Aaron McKee, um, 
he was kind of in the process of transitioning like very like early stages into his, his career as a head coach. And, you know, I was, I'm very big in social media, every program I've been at. And uh, I just had tried to explain to him, you know, it's very valuable, especially when he's going to transition to a head coach, you know, it's a big platform to display your brand um, and who you are as a head coach. And, you know, he's an old school guy. He played for John Chaney. Um, so, you know, he's very old school and how he does things. Um, and he worked for coach Dunphy. Dunphy's very old school as well. And Dunphy didn't believe in, in social media. And I can understand that because, you know, he's about 70, 70 something years old. He, he's about to retire, but uh, Aaron McKee's kind of younger. And so I, it took me months to convince him to say, Hey coach, you really need to, to um, create a social media account. And, um, you know, eventually one of the guys who worked in the athletic department, he worked in the football department, transitioned into athletics, um, the overall scale. And he helped me kind of convince Aaron McKee to create him one. Um, and, you know, now Aaron McKee, after one day of him creating it, he had 875 followers. I mean, it's insane. But regardless of that, um, it's really good for your brand. I mean, especially when you're at a small school as a head coach, it's a way to showcase your program. Um, just in general. And as a coach too, you can really showcase yourself um, personally, um, just to my point. And I, do you mind if I answer Melanie's question? Um, so when she asked if, uh, if you would work for a women's coach, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this because there's so many guys out there. I think the NBA, WNBA isn't the same thing as the NBA, but my basketball is basketball. It's, it's such a transferable sport. Um, I was on a Zoom call with a former NBA coach, and he said they stole a play from an NAIA Women's Division II team um, that they ran in the NBA. Um, it's crazy. If you can win, you can win. I mean, that, that's just all it is, basically, to it. If you can win and be a good people person and have the right people on your staff, I mean, you, you, you can win at any level, um, personally. Some of, the, some of the best coaches I've been around have been women's coaches. I got to work for um, – I don't know if you know who that is, but Tom Shirley – He's the head women's coach at Jefferson University with, with Coach Herb DeGee. Um, they're like one of the winningest coaching duos in, in college basketball history. Um, he's the AD there. He's, he's hey. Say that again? Sorry, I didn't hear you. But the he's, history of Herb DeGee. Yeah, he's, they're, they're both unbelievable guys, awesome dudes, and I had a pleasure working with them for about, for about four or five months. And I learned a lot from both of them, and he always was willing to sit down in the office and talk. And, I mean, they were the number two team in the country at one point um, last year, so – I think basketball is such a transferable sport. I, I really don't think it matters. There's such a huge gap in that. And, um, you know, you see the NBA trying to do a lot of the, the bridging with Becky Hammond being hired and um, Kara Lawson with the Boston Celtics. So I, I really don't think it matters personally. I mean, if, if you got a network, you got a network, especially people don't understand like women's basketball coaches have networks too. Um, and no, Pat Summit, I mean, everybody knew her, Kim Mulkey, just to name the big coaches. Um, I really don't think it matters. But there's never been a woman uh, coach that has coached on the men's side. Do you I, I agree. And that's what I was talking about. Like, yeah. would, would that be something guys would be uncomfortable working for the woman that is a head coach coaching men? You know what so, I mean? Like, that's a whole yeah. different. So I'll and say this. Steve, I'll even ask Steve, would you be comfortable interviewing and opening your box up to interviewing a woman for a head coaching job? Actually, so I'll say this. So I worked for a school. <laughs> for a head coach. <laughs> so I worked for a head coach. And he was, so he was interviewing for a job and a woman got the job over him and, and, and he was extremely pissed off. And I mean, the woman was a pro player for years. And so he, he was like pissed. And I think so many men are just would be uncomfortable with that, but I, I just don't see the issue behind it. For me personally, I mean, why does it really matter? If you could, if you can win, you can win. That's, that's just all it is for me. Send, send Pat some at my way. I'll, I'll take her any day of the week. Oh, um, just to be respectful of time, we'll wrap up there. Uh, I want to thank Steve, uh, thank Melanie, um, both phenomenal stories, uh, f phenomenal perspective. I'm grateful for that, just the openness and, and the, the, the relatability between the two Final Four panel participants on episode two of Unspoken Conversations. Um, Melanie. Being in, trying to get into Division One sports for ten years now, you'll get two hundred and fifty phone calls from every coach in the country on um, people they have to work on your staff if you were to get a head man's job at the Division One level. Um, and Steve, 
as always, I'm grateful for your mentorship and, and, and just helping me grow as a professional. Um, everyone else on the call, thank you. Uh, Melanie put her information in the chat as well as Steve did. So if you want to connect with them further, they both are really two genuine people who want those around them to be better um, and, and you can benefit and learn a lot from them. So if it, anything else, Steve or Melanie, you want to say before we go? No, I just want to say thank you, Travis. I, I, um, I respect what you're doing. It's one of those things that is setting, like Steve said, setting you apart. Um, and what Asia was talking about with social media, um, one of I'm just going to shoot you out one idea. I have a guy that was student assistant for Kevin Stallings, and uh, then he he did stuff on the men's side and women's side in the NBA and WNBA as a video guy, and now he's a video guy at a, a Big Ten program, and he put something out, and that's kind of what Dale did as a video guy at, at uh, UCLA. They put something out on social media that was not branding them or their coach or the program. It was educational, like sending a top play of the week, you know, where you're, you're teaching the game and giving people ideas. I take his thing every week and I forward it on to my head coach and say, hey, this is the kind of stuff I've been talking about that we should run. And, and so I think you can also um, show your coaching ability because, you know, like, like Steve said, we want people that can coach. You know, and if that's how I got to know and advance a guy that had not been on the court coaching, I said, what you been doing? And he had been, he created that himself. So be creative um, and, and try to help others and it'll all come back to you. There's ways that you can show your skill set. Well, thanks everybody. Um, thanks again. Appreciate the time. And if that's it. Ready to close out the call. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, Travis. I'll be on every one. When's my boy Dale going to be on? Two weeks. Two, Two weeks? weeks. Yep. I don't want to miss that. No, I get it to you. I get the information to you. <laughs> The best hires ever made. So, and, and it's been great to get to know you and meet you through him because, uh, like you said, once we get that personal connection, that's where you're going to get your opportunities, Travis. And, and what you're doing here is is it, it's educational, and it's networking for you're helping others connect. Um, and that's how you know God will take care of you because people will want to. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome. Wait, at some point. I look forward to meeting your wife and, and your family sometime. Okay. And it's soon. I so. know. I'll be up there. You got to get over to Purdue. I, All right, I, man. All right. Take care. Thank you.